thank you very much, Martin, for the for the brief introduction. Um, we will talk about pen restyling today. Uh, before we get into that, we thought we'll give you a little bit of a background about Dave's works, about my work, just to put it into context where our um, explorations come from. Then following that, we'll um, talk about briefly about what pen, pen restylings are, in case you haven't uh, engaged with that very much. And then the third part of the talk will really be about uh, the exciting um, forms of deformations of what do you do with all of that. Um, so I'll, I'll hand over to Dave. So I'm Dave Murray Rust. Um, as Martin said, I look at human algorithm interaction. So how do people and computational systems find ways to get along in the world? Uh, the closest I really get to proper mathematics is uh, looking at kind of how people discuss proofs and how people argue about them and how these things that we think are nice and hard edged and formal are actually quite socially constructed and messy uh, as they go along. Um, but I, I like to take kind of mathematical systems. This is a cryptographic blockchain system and turn them into physical objects, uh, often full of chocolate to create joy and surprise and give people a quite physical understanding of abstract concepts. Uh, I also like to support collaboration between artists and scientists. So this is uh, an outcome of a residency where we had uh, a whole collection of artists working with satellite data to render it in various ways. And this is a, a tapestry woven based on uh, atmospheric data. And you can see the satellite sweeps across the globe as they do it. Um, but really, I like making physical stuff that people can play with. So this is a chaotic pendulum that means that a six-year-old in a leopard suit can uh, start to understand the relations between time and space and frequency and rhythm. And I'll pass over to Teresa. Um, so as Martin said, I work with wood. Um, the, the physical understanding of things is kind of my, the thing that excites me um, the most. So I'm co coming certainly more from the uh, visualization side of things and that was always the, the point that I found very easy in mathematics I'm not so much a conceptual person but like from a visual point of view um, that always came quite easy so I just put together a few pieces of work um, relating to what we will talk about uh, right afterwards um, I work with wood as I mean most of you uh, every one of us had a piece of wood in our hands but what I find exciting about wood is that no piece of wood is the same um, even though like the principle is kind of the same of right, it grows, it, it has like uh, growth rings, it has texture. Um, so this was a work where I was taking like um, rubbish really, like from the wood workshop, uh, cutting it up and looking inside um, and discovering the, well, the different characters. Like here you see the green, for example, which would, um, which adds another story to the wood itself, like of the, of the previous treatment of it. Um, so this is like here we still talk about patterns about like surfaces about 2D uh, planes, but as a sculptor, I like the 3D very much. <laughs> so uh, this is a piece I called heaven and earth. So here, um, this is like an organically like a wood that grew that, that had a twist while it grew, uh, which you must have seen before um, trees sometimes have wonderful um, twists uh, when you look at them. Um, you find that in all scales and, and shapes. Uh, this was a small tree at that time. Um, and I took that, that twist uh, and had it move from one from one shape to the other shape, like here from a flower shape to, to a star shape. And like five pointed um, shapes are, are quite common um, when you go and explore the natural world. So I found that very exciting and have applied it to others as well. Um, then where this leads to, like this is now really my, the heart of my work is like I, I take principles, I, I take patterns and forms um, and I add a layer of, of, of life, of human interactions into it. So there is a, an example of a very recent work here. So uh, that was brief and quick. Uh, and let's see what we what Dave can say, tell us about Penrose tiling. Yeah, so Martin said that uh, we should probably talk a bit about what Penrose tiles are. Um, because certainly for me, it's something I, I knew a bit about, but I didn't really know the ins and, out, ins and outs until we started exploring them. So this is Roger Penrose. 
um, who recently won the Nobel Prize for something very different uh, about the formation of black holes. Um, and on the left is a is a Penrose tiling, and the the tiling means um, you can keep adding tiles to this until you have a pattern that could cover an infinite plane. So it, it extends forever uh, if you want it to, but it has a couple of interesting properties. Firstly, it's aperiodic, and that means that if you were to translate the pattern, you'd never find another place where the whole thing lines up. You can find bits where it sort of lines up for a little bit, but you can't do that at a large scale. Um, but it can still be symmetric about the center. So th this is quite a, a strange kind of object um, between regularity and irregularity. Uh, there was a bit of a evolution. So the very, the first, sets of Penrose tilings came out of explorations with pentagons and trying to get pentagons to uh, cover a plane and finding the, the shapes that you needed to then fill in the gaps to make that work. Um, and that was then developed into ones that used less different shapes. So the P2 tiling in the middle only uses kites and darts, so just two shapes. And then the P3 tiling, which is the one we actually work with uh, in this project uses rhombuses uh, of slightly different shapes to do the work. Um, the thing that I'd never really thought about is how do you actually construct one of these? Um, and so my first thought would be, okay, let's uh, have a tile and then add more tiles around it. Um, and people do do this. Uh, to make this work, it helps if you add colored lines to the tiles and you put them so that you always have a red line meeting a red line and a green line meeting a green line. Uh, and this helps you end up with situations like that. Uh, but if you want to do something algorithmically, and we did because if you can generate things, you can explore different possibilities. Um, it turns out that uh, the most direct way to do it or the easiest way to do it um, is what they call deflation. And the idea here is rather than starting with tiles and adding more to make it bigger, you start with the shape and you progressively chop it up uh, into smaller versions of itself. So there's a bit of a relation here with fractals and um, scale invariant patterns and things like that. So this came from uh, just Googling how do you make Penrose tiles and finding a nice uh, Python blog about how do you do it that goes through all the steps with some code that you can try. This is a really nice outcome of kind of open science processes. Um, and so the way it works is uh, you take a couple of triangles, um, which you can reflect to get these rhombuses, um, and you then recursively divide these up. So you can start with two like that. This is n equals one in the top right. You can chop them. Uh, according to this schema and get new triangles. So that's n equals two, which would turn into a tiling like that. And if you do this again, you get more and more and they get smaller and smaller. And at some point you say, well, wouldn't it be nice if this was a bit more complete so you can reflect it um, about the initial axis and suddenly this starts to really look like Penrose tiles. And then to get the five-fold symmetry, if you then uh, make five of these rotated by 72 degrees each time, you get a nice uh, complete pattern there. Uh, so that's a, an algorithmic approach to making Penrose tiles. And you can do more and more iterations and have finer and finer granularity. So now the, the question comes like what like to me as an artist, like to what extent is it necessary to understand all of that um, to work with? Um, which is an, an interesting question, and um, I mean, that's one of the reasons why it's fantastic to work with other people, and in my case with Dave. Um, so I'm not a mathematician, but what, what I do understand, what I do like to work with a lot is like how shapes fit together. Um, and for me to work with Penrose tiles to, to realize that actually the, the Pentagon is the one that um, that kind of kicked it off um, was was fascinating. It, like it, it comes together from um, we've like when you when you when you try to make it like how how do you say that when you take sh shapes and they fit together you can make a a two like a surface with it but when you try to do that with pentagons you need to go into 3d if you want to surface like the, the edges to meet um so here we are like talking between 2d and 3d which is back again uh in in my world of things um so i would say this is that was usually uh beneficial to to be able to think about it 
like that. Um, so now we go to the deforming, uh, so to the very exciting bit of, of what to me the very exciting bit of it. Um, so the, the the kind of inspiration here was that um, a Penrose tiling is is a wonderful mathematical object, but to do things creatively with it, it's nice to be able to have some variation in this. Um, and as part of my extensive literature search by googling Penrose tiles. Um, we came across uh, a lovely blog article in a slightly unexpected place. So this is Richard Welbury writing in um, in a crystallographic blog about Penrose tilings and uh, quasi crystals. So he's he's got this lovely image at the top of the blog, which shows um, a pattern that gradually morphs from one thing to another. And of course, it it kind of evokes some of these Escher wood prints where things morph from one thing into another. Um, and But what he's doing, he was interested in um, these funny states of matter called quasi-crystals where there's some kind of structure, uh, but it's not repetitive. Uh, so crystals normally have a repeating lattice structure and this, this is what gives them a lot of uh, the properties they have. Um, so he was looking for ways to mutate, deform, change and shape the Penrose tiling, where it kept kind of the pattern that it has and the structure that it has, but he could alter some of the properties around that. Uh, so the one on the left is a is a normal Penrose tiling and the two on the right are two deformations in different directions of this. Um, and just to kind of connect this a little bit, uh, this is a simulation of an actual quasi-crystal. So this is silver being deposited on a uh, aluminium palladium manganese plate. And you can see a bit of relation with these bits of five-fold symmetry and bits of other symmetries, but nothing that quite works as long-range order. So how do we actually make these? Uh, there's many, many ways that you can deform systems like this. Uh, but in order to keep the, the structure and the interesting symmetric qualities, um, he looked into saying, right, there's about eight different ways that tiles come together. Uh, you'll notice three and eight look the same. This is part of the way he's constructed this group of uh, junctions. Um, we don't want to move, and what we'll do is look at moving the dot in the middle of uh, the lines where the tiles meet. Um, we don't want to move the dot in the middle of the uh, five-fold ones because that will mess up the symmetry. But the other ones we can define an angle and a uh, and a distance, um, and we'll take every point like that in the diagram and move it in that direction by that distance. Um, to make things simple, uh, he was mostly working, and we're mostly working with uh, ones where all of the junctions get deformed the same amount. Um, but there is a huge parameter space that you can play with of slightly different kinds of deformation. And to show what that looks like, um, this is what happens if we deform all of them by a quarter of a tile uh, in one direction, or a quarter of a tile in the other direction. Uh, so you can see it's got exactly the same underlying structure, but um, it comes out looking uh, reasonably different. It's no longer such a simple tiling. You can, if you look at say the orange shapes, you'll see there's a lot more different shapes in there. It's not just two different tiles, uh, but it gives a really nice space to start playing in. And once you can do that, uh, you can start varying this deformation uh, over space, which is how he had the original image from uh, the blog. So this is minus half a tile at the top and plus half a tile at the bottom. Um, and you can also do things like vary it radially, radially instead. So you can start applying different mathematical transforms to the way that you're carrying out this deformation. Um, and if you look at it with lines, you get quite a different sense of it. So that this looks a bit more flowery and uh, pattern-like. Uh, you can also play with some quite extreme deformations. So this is no longer really a tiling because uh, the tiles are all overlapping, but as a line drawing, um, you see some interesting structures and you can also take it to extremes. I've got no idea how this one survives the zoom compression, uh, 
but when you look at it in real resolution, you can start to see sets of five circles here and there um, and a bit of structure coming through uh, the blurriness. So this means we now have a space to play in where we can talk about how many iterations we're doing of the division, um, how much deformation we do in what direction and how we vary it uh, across the plane. And now Teresa is going to talk about putting it into the world. Well, as you will have noticed by now, there, there are choices involved uh, in, in how to create these patterns. Like we have all these tools, but then there are the choices come into place. And this is where, where humans have a, have a say um, in where we're going to go. So as I said before, like the 2D to the 3D is the thing that, that excites me the most. And we, talk, we looked at all these patterns and, and a, like possibilities to generate these patterns. And we were like, well, but what, what if, like, if we bring that into the world? So the first thing we did, um, we did a test, uh, a quick test run on a on a CNC machine, um, like working with wood that that was kind of at hand, um, and like here we we actually we didn't use like real wood, we used like plywood, which has its layers. So when you when you add when you translate a pattern a little bit into depth, you do get all these layers uh, showing up as well. So that was already one one bit that. Um, excited us but the other one is um here once you once you work with material there's there's always an element of a surprise in it uh, so we were uh, holding it up and saw that the light uh, came came through the the resolution on this is not very good i will show you more pictures later on just to give you that idea of of what work, working with materials can can lead to there there's always something that you don't know about before um, so going back to the uh, initial pattern, so we have this pattern here, or we've made choices uh, with these variables to, to work with this pattern, let's say. Um, we uh, wrote a G code ab about that uh, and like making it suitable for a CNC machine. Um, right there, there we go. And we, we kind of looked at like, you can do pre-runs with that, uh, which is, which is again, interesting because the lines uh, to the generation of lines movement is added. Um, so there's a bit of an insight of that process. Um, when we are actually go to the CNC machine, we can again test run it and see the, the computer running through the pattern and finding the, the easiest way or the quickest way for the computer to uh, to run it, which is again interesting, like what choices are being made here um, through how we program it, how we translated it, and how now how the computer translates the pattern again um, as a as a little uh, side. And th this is one of the interesting moments where you know if you're talking about abstract mathematical shapes and they intersect, that's an interesting problem. If you're talking about physical drill bits and bits of wood and they intersect, then that that's a that's a real problem with things flying all around the workshop. Um, so here to give you an idea of, of what that looks like, um, we start with a pattern. Um, and because it's wood, like if you would go in really deep at once, um, it would blunt the tool, it would probably, like it rips the fibers. So what we needed to do is we needed to cut the same pattern, um, like at least like three times to go deeper and deeper and deeper every time, uh, which means that the tool itself has has an element of, of design in it. Um, so here, you there's a bit of that, um, but just to give you like show you a close up as well. So you see the star in the middle there, and it has round corners, which the original pattern wouldn't have. But this is something that the tool adds adds to that. Um, here, like what you what we showed you before, like in the simulation here, you would have that um, how that actually looks like with within the machine. So if we would take this project any further, I found that, that bit like extremely interesting of where do you stop, where do you start? Uh, like there's this idea of this endlessly growing seeming, seamless pattern. Um, but then like what, what of these elements do you need to communicate that? Um, so there is a, a finished piece if some, something like that uh, exists. Um, again, holding it up through the light. Uh, you do see like the different views of, of light coming through and that is again a property of the wood itself like with its grain. Um, and then um, we did some further exploration. So this is fairly recent, um, but I thought I'll, I'll put it in um, because it's very exciting to me. So we've we've created like uh, we've played around with CNC and, and plywood um, and and created like um, 
deformations, like you start on one end and how does it develop into, into another pattern on the other end. But this is still, we're still very much talking on the 2D plane. Um, so I've had, uh, we're not just talking about woodwork now, I'm afraid. <laughs> Uh, I have been uh, in like um, I've worked with all sorts of materials as well, and clay has been one of them. And the nice thing about clay is it doesn't have grain; um, it's it's super moldable and flexible. So when I take the wood now and use it as a mold and press it into clay, so there's one one image here now um, where the the wooden mold and the clay is kind of lying opposite of each other. So you like the pattern that was once created gets a different translation uh, in the clay, like what's being picked up on it depending on how much pressure you put onto it. Um, if you put a little bit more pressure onto it, uh, something like that comes out. Um, and then like we have this 2D plane. And now and this is something super exciting for someone like me working with materials. You can you can deform it just just with your hands, just by, by looking at it. So no, no um, principles here uh, that need to be taken care of. Like I, I have something to start with and I can start deforming it um, quite intuitively. So that that was um, where a, a very recent exploration here now uh, using, using stones um, or even there taking it further into space, which reminded me of one of the talks yesterday talking about 17th century um, perspectives uh, in Dutch painting. So th that actually came about at looking at 15th century Flemish art and how to how how fabrics are being like um, communicated con convincingly on on a 2D uh, surface. Um, and and that was that. Yeah, we are very good in time. Um, thank you very much. There is time for questions. We put our contact details up here um, for for any lengthy conversations that might follow.